Dr. Frank Hale again, extension entomologist with the University of Tennessee Extension. What's that mean? That means I work with the general public, farmers, landscape professionals. I work on as entomology, my areas of expertise are entomology of ornamental plants, uh, turf grass, grass that's used for sports fields or golf courses or just backyards. Also work with vegetable uh, crops, of course, which are pollinated by what? Bees, right? Work with fruit crops that are pollinated by bees. Also work with tobacco, and I do statewide. So any farmer that grows any of those crops statewide, I'm your entomologist, okay? And uh, I'm located here in Middle Tennessee. I live in Franklin, and I work at the Ellington Agricultural Center on the south, south part of uh, Nashville. If you need to get a hold of me, get a hold of Janie, and she can get a hold of me, any questions you have. Uh, so I put this together, this talk, a few years ago on native bees for the uh, summer celebration field day in Jackson, big ornamental plant field day. And I didn't know a lot about native bees, truthfully, because I've worked primarily as an entomologist with integrated pest management, with an emphasis on managing pests. And bees, we don't really consider pests. We consider them what? We generally consider them beneficial. Now, if it's a wasp and it's staying you in your backyard, it is a pest. So it's an arbitrary term to give it. But in general, we look at bees as being very beneficial. If you want to see this, get a, co a PDF copy of this presentation and other ones I presented this year, you can go to the soil. Plant to the pest center, write that down. So I'll plant the pest center. Well, it's on your handout. And then go to that orange bar that says publications. I'll put your cursor on that and it'll, and it'll drop down. Click on presentations. So right here, publications, then present, presentations. And you can look at PDFs and color of all my talks this, that I've done this year, the majority of them. So, and Dr. Alan Wyndham, our plant pathologist, award-winning Twitter person. He actually was one of the top green industry Twitter accounts this year in, in green industry magazines. Uh, so he, and we also have a, a Facebook page you might want to check out at the Soil Plant and Pest Center. You can click on our Facebook page. Talk about insects and diseases, and if you really like things in the garden, it's a great uh, Facebook page. Another, it's award-winning too. A lot of awards on it. Uh, this talk is based on a, a book that's available online, a really good book on native bees. So when I had to study, you know, I didn't know a lot as much about bees as, as a lot of people. I uh, checked out this publication online by Patrice, um, I believe it's you know, Mosaic, and Stephen Buchanan, and it's what it looks like. And there's some southeastern uh, blueberry bees there some ones on Zalia, another type B, but you can check out that link. Well, when you think about bees, I had no idea there were 4,000 species of bees in the U.S. Did you know that? 4,000. So when we're talking about bees, most people think of what? Honeybees. Yeah. Honeybees aren't even from here. They've been domesticated. I believe the Egyptians had honeybees. It's for thousands of years. Mankind has domesticated these bees. They can move the, the nest or the hives from place to place. And they, wherever they went, they brought their bees. And so bees are now all over the world. Now, there are not, not as many honey, wild honey bees today. Why do you think that is? Anybody have any idea? Do you think it's because of pesticides? Maybe. Well, a lot of people would think that, but it's probably not the truth. The main reason was we don't have as many bees is called, it's a phenomenon called invasive pests. The bees get groa mites from Asia that will attack them. They get the viruses that can be transmitted by the groa mites. So insects can get viruses and bacteria, they can get sick. So groa mites actually feed and suck their hemolymph, so they feed directly on the bees. So the bees have lots of pests and in a when we have bees, any beekeepers here? So fast thinking, what do you guys do? You have to protect against bromides. That's fumigants. That insect is fumigants. 
because we have invasive pests. And folks, the biggest problem, you know, a lot of people say, well, climate change is, uh, could be a big problem someday. But right now, the biggest problem that we see, 120 billion or more dollars every year it costs us in the U.S. is invasive pests. Year after year, 120 plus billion dollars. And did you know we're going to lose all the ash tree? All the ash species in North America are basically going to go extinct because of one little beetle called the emerald ash borer. Came over, came into the Detroit, Michigan area, and uh, uh, 10, 15, well, probably 15 or more years ago, and it spread throughout the Midwest. Now it's in Tennessee. So emerald ash borer kills ash trees. It's from China. The beetle came from China. Probably brought in on pallets of wood, shipping Chinese parts to probably the uh, automobile company or some big industry up in Detroit. It's spread from that one area all throughout the North America. It's even found out west now. So invasive pests attack bees. Invasive pests attack our native plants. And it's the biggest ecological problem we have today, even bigger than climate change, because every day we're really paying big time for it. So we see that pollination is happening. Each native plant has co-evolved with bees. You know what I'm talking about? Over thousands or millions of years, the plants and the bees have lived together. And they've, they've sort of specialized on certain plants. So certain native bees are only out at a certain time of the year. They're feeding on a certain, or they're getting nectar and pollen from certain type of plants. They don't go to all the plants. Honey bees tend to be more generalist. They'll go to lots of different flowering plants. But our native bees tend to be a little more specialized. So a native bee might only be out for a month period of time, or in the spring, or in the midsummer, depending on what plant they, they pollinate. Over 80% of the 250,000 flowering plant species in the world have native bees. So wherever you go, you're going to have different plants, you're going to have different bees pollinators. So I mean, that's the neat thing about the travel, I think. Wherever you go in the world, you have different plants and animals and insects. Insects are animals. Uh, then 75% of fruits, nuts, and vegetables grown in the country are pollinated. This southeastern blueberry bee is not real prevalent in Tennessee. It's more even further south where you have blueberries. But look how efficient they are. Maybe it's 50,000 blueberry flowers. They could, one bee can, can do more than 6,000 ripe blueberries. How much is that worth? That one bee, $20. A little native bee, you pay that bee nothing. You know, it's just there. And, uh, so that's a putting a dollar amount to it. Pretty amazing. That's what the little bee looks like. It sort of looks like a small bumblebee. You can see the blueberry blossoms. They're kind of bell shaped or kind of tunnels. And they have to have fairly long mouth parts to get in there. They're in the family uh, of day. Now, they think that bees years, you know, this is millions of years ago. Did you know their study of fossil insects? You've all seen Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. I've got some amber with insects in it, mites. Pretty cool. Those species are ex extinct. There's more species that have come and gone, that lived and gone extinct, and they're on the earth right now. It's in the fossil record. And we don't even know how many insect species there are. We haven't discovered them all. Possible there'll be some that we'll never ever discover that will extinct before we even find them. But um, we think 125 million years ago we had bees that evolved from predaceous wasps. What does predaceous mean? Eating right. on other things, isn't it? Yeah. Wasps are actually somewhat beneficial to feed on caterpillars in the garden and other insects. So they're carnivores, they're predaceous. Some are parasitoids, some wasps will actually lay. And the people here have seen a hornworm. The hornworm caterpillar. It has these little white cocoons coming out of the back. You ever seen that? There's a tiny wasp that lays egg in the caterpillar. In about two weeks, the larvae will feed inside. They're called endoparasites. They feed inside the caterpillar. When they are ready to pupate, 
because they have to go through a pupil stage like the butterflies do. Uh, they'll pop out of the back of the, of the caterpillar and then you'll almost immediately, within the first half hour, they'll start spinning a white cocoon, a little oblong white football shape, even narrower. Uh, and you'll see maybe 50 of these white cocoons on the back of that caterpillar. That caterpillar by now is lethargic. It's been fed on for several weeks, not doing very well. You leave that in the garden because there's going to be 50 little wasps that come out and lay their eggs in other caterpillars. That's called biological control. So we conserve in the garden. We want to conserve those benefits. But we think that at some time the wasps uh, switch to utilizing the nectar. Nectar is a carbohydrate. It's like soda pop. I'm drinking a sweet and iced tea. It keeps me going here. Take a little drink. Gives me energy, carbohydrate. Uh, what gives the pollen source for bees? What's the protein source? I mean, I gave it away. Pollen. Yeah. Pollen is the protein source for bees. So what do we they need protein, they need carbohydrate, just like you guys do. And there's a picture of a you know, like a squash or something. It's probably imported cabbage worm butterfly, a little white butterfly, and moth uh, caterpillar you see, it's a green caterpillar. And then this little wasp chewing that caterpillar up into a little ball. Now, why do they do that? Because in those little paper nests, each one of those cells, they lay a single egg, the female does. The female that overwinters in your attic is the queen. In the spring, she starts making a paper mache nest. She chews up fence posts. She makes a nest out of paper. She lays an egg in it. When that larva hatches, it's hanging upside down. She comes along and gives a little ball of caterpillar. Each one of those larvae she feeds. That's a good parent. And, and when she's the only, she's a single mom. She's the only one. She has to do the work. She has to bring all the bacon home. She has to feed the kids. Once those larvae then develop into pupae, develop into adults, they're going to be quick, they're going to be females. So when you see a bunch of wasps on it, those are the, her children. Those are the females. And then they go out and catch more caterpillars so they can make the nest even bigger. That's why yellow jackets and hornets and wasps can have many individuals in their nests. Look at this picture. Uh, Terrence Godfrey is a photojournalist, and he came to interview me one time, and, and he said, hey, look what flew on the windshield of my car, and I took that with my, I think, an iPhone. Pretty good picture, though. I couldn't take that good picture. He's a photojournalist. He's a professional. But anyway, perfect picture of uh, a paper wasp feeding on a piece of caterpillar. So they chew them up into nice little bite-sized pieces to feed them young. So she's not eating that, she's bringing that back to her nest. Did you know all that happened? So, so these paper wasps, everybody says, oh, kill them, kill them. They're actually eating caterpillars that are feeding on your, your garden. So they roll the colorful up and then you... Yeah, they, they'll take little pieces of it, chew up little pieces, chew off pieces. You know, got a cut over this long, they chew the head part, they just cut it in little pieces and take it back. So one caterpillar might feed three or four larvae. See what I mean? Nice little round packets. You see that? That's a nice picture of a caterpillar. Uh, Paper wasps eating a little chunk of caterpillar there, bringing it back to the nest. Now, solitary bees versus social bees. A lot of our native bees, some, some are solitary bees. That means each female has her little nest, and she doesn't have a bunch of worker bees with her. She pretty much does the whole thing. Solitary bees live alone as adults. They raise their brood or their offspring alone. Where the social bees, I often call them the anti-social bees because they're the ones that tend to sting you. So the solitary bees, that just one individual, like even a cicada killer wasp, who catches cicadas, that cicada killer wasp will sting and paralyze the cicada. They'll take it to an underground nest and provision that nest, lay an egg on it, and then that larva devours the cicada. Now the cicada killer wasp is, they look, it's a wasp that long, it's the biggest wasp around here, but they rarely ever sting people. The male will sometimes get in your face and sort of territorial, but they don't tend to sting. They're not, but the social bees, what happens when you get near a yellow jacket nest? Or you just get near it. You don't have to do anything. They'll start stinging you. They're very protective. So they're somewhat anti-social. 
Okay, social bees, so this overwintering queen, again, just like the wasp in your attic, comes out in the spring, builds a nest, lays eggs, and gets food for the young. And then the workers are there to help the mother build a bigger nest. It could be thousands of individuals in a big hornet nest, for instance. And then it all starts, new queens are developed in the fall, they'll overwinter. So as the process goes on and on. Here's a yellow jacket nest. If you're that close, be careful. Yeah, what do they do? Yellow jackets usually get an underground burrow from an animal. They've already excavated something underground, and guess what? Yellow jackets will have their nest in there. Uh, social bees, have you ever seen little bees? It looks like somebody got a pencil and pushed holes in the ground. And little yeah. bees going in. And those are solitary bees. Now those are, what do you say about solitary bees? They're more docile, don't tend to sting. If you want to get rid of solitary bees, water, water that area of the lawn every day. They don't like to be flooded. Does anybody like to be flooded? Yeah. Nah, nobody likes to be flooded. It's a mess. You flood them every day, they tend to do it. Yellow jackets, I don't think I'd try that on yellow jackets. Um, a little bit about the pollen. There's special uh, stiff little hair structures on the hind legs. Have you ever seen a honeybee thing? And you see these little kind of stiff structures? They collect pollen. Their, the hairs on their body are sort of branch feathery hairs on bees. And pollen then sticks to them. So when they're in the flower, they get all this pollen. Then they brush off the, the pollen and they collect it or accumulate it on the, on the hind legs. So they're collecting pollen to take back to the nest because pollen is what? What you use for? To eat, eat for protein. Yeah. Okay. So the wasps don't have these branch hairs. Uh, we can also, I didn't know this, we can, we can break down the, the bees and whether they have long tongues or long mouth parts or short. Now if you have longer mouth part, what's that allow that bee to do? Is in some two type flowers, real long flowers? Yeah, they're going to need longer. Uh, so Apidae, some of those, Megachilidae, those have longer mouth parts. Now they can also feed on you know, like, a, let's say, a parsley plant. It has flat, humble a flower and little open flowers, very short. They can also feed on those, but short tongue bees have shorter mouth parts and they like these asters and daisies and umbelifera, those type of plants. Here, check out. And there's a long, you see what I'm talking about, the mouth parts? Reaching all the way down here, getting nectar. So when they're in that flower, you see those bright, those hairy, how bees are kind of fuzzy, those branch feathery hairs, they're collecting pollen on them. Look at how, how long that tongue is for that. It's called osmia, and it's, uh, you can see it's very long. It looks like it's got a little nest in the wood there, a little hole in it. When it's in the flowers, it reaches those long flowers. Here's a short tongue bee. A lot of flowers are like that. That looks like a sunflower, I think, or something like that. Maybe I don't know. Daisy. So what what do we know about bees? They 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 uh, care for their young. How do they care for their young? Well, they provision the cells or the, where they where they lay their egg. They don't just lay an egg. They provision that little cell with that little nest with nectar and pollen, and so their saliva. And they actually make it, they mix it together, and make a little uh, pollen loaf. So it's all stuck together with nectar, saliva, and pollen. So you got this carbohydrate, you have the protein, it's a nice little loaf, you put that in there with the egg. When the egg hatches, the larva does what? It's got its food right there. So mama provides, nature provides. And they say that saliva has some antibacterial, antifungal properties that helps keep it the, the food source from getting moldy and turning bad. Well, that's amazing, isn't it? What about cuckoo bees? You ever heard of cuckoo birds, cuckoo bees? Their species is three from three families of bees. They'll lay their eggs in the nest of other bees. 
some will kill the host, will kill the larvae of the other bee before laying eggs, and the mother might kill the larvae and then lay the egg. But uh, most cuckoo bees uh, larvae feed on the store, either the store food and the larvae. So they're robbing, they're robbing it, not because of its life and its food. Okay. And they look a little bit like a wasp. Doesn't that look a little bit like a wasp bee? A little bit more than some of the bees. It has some hairs on it, but uh, so it doesn't look like a bubble bee or a bee. It looks a little more wasp shaped, but it is a bee. Lots of uh, lots of these native bees will build either underground nests or they'll use hollow stems or holes in trees made by other insects like wood boring insects. So they take advantage of uh, things that are already out there. Okay, there's a lot of trees out there, a lot of holes in trees. And so, so when we talk about, you know, having a diverse environment, if we had a woods and we killed every old tree and took it out and didn't have old trees, old trees have habitat for them. I think bats can get under trees, under the bark. They can get it, and certain things can get in hollow trees. So, same way with bees. And, and again, so you, each cell is provisioned with food that they need to become an adult. So, what are, what are we talking about a cell? It might be a carpenter bee might make little cells of, of chewed up wood inside the wood, little compartments. A leaf cutter bee will actually take pieces of leaves about that big, will kind of glue them together, and it will surround the egg and the food. So the larvae feeds within a little cell about that big. But it's made of leaves. Here shows an underground nest. And you see that yellow stuff there? That's that pollen and nectar. And then the little whitish thing on top would be the larvae. So it's, larvae's got a lot to eat there. It's going to have to go through its whole development, so it's going to need that. So that one female has a nest that branches in the underground, and she built that whole thing, and she laid in one egg in each one of those little brood galleries where the larvae sit. And then when those go through the larval stage, they'll pupate. You know what I mean by pupa, don't you? Like a butterfly uh, will have a chrysalis, or a moth will have might have a cocoon or a naked pupae, and it goes from the caterpillar larval stage, it transforms into, through metamorphosis to what? The butterfly, the adult. In this case, the adult's a bee. So it's called complete metamorphosis. It happens in butterflies, happens in bees, happens in beetles. Here's what we were talking about, miners or digger bees. Use the nest in the ground. Sometimes we get calls from people about the, in the spring about these little bees, honey bee size or smaller, coming out of the ground, and they're just worried to death. And these are solitary bees, so each queen has her own little hole in the ground. They don't tend to stay, so it would be safe on a school ground. Oh, really? But school ground, so what could we do? They're going to get rid of them on the school ground. Just tell them to water them every day. Get out there, water them a lot, flood them out. But they're only going to be there about a month or less, a short period of time. Okay. And again, they provision those each cell with food. The egg is laid in the chamber, it's sealed up. Sometimes uh, uh, mason bees, leaf cutter bees, they like to. They, I know Mark, you said you sometimes put some nest out for them. You can get little straws or different things, and you can make your own little uh, uh, places for them. give them a habitat. And they'll look for holes in wood. Sometimes you just get a block of wood, and you can drill in it, different size holes. They'll go in there. Uh, often they'll these brood cells will be end to end. So if it's a straw this long or a tube this long, it might have 15 or 20 different cells in it. One, one after another. And once they get, become adults, they break through the cells and exit. Sometimes mason bees use mud to construct partition walls between the eggs and cells. 
Sometimes it's good in the garden to have a little damp place. Butterflies will go there to get minerals. Bees will go there to get mud to make their nests. Mud daubers and such. A little place with rocks and a little uh, mud by the side of the stream is very important. And also, they, they plug this thing a little thicker. They don't want a parasite, another type of wasp that can parasitize their larva getting in there. <coughs> so it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, isn't it? There's always something trying to get at them. Leaf cutter bees, again, use little roundish leaf pieces to line their burrows. And you can make these little bee walls or bee houses with uh, paper drinking straws. You can tie them together. You can get hollow twigs, like a, you ever get elderberry, you can get some hollow twigs out of that. Just put them side by side in a bundle. You can stick them in a milk carton, kind of glue them in that's against the carton, glue it and stick it in there, and they'll have a nice little tunnel. You can get a block of wood, drills, and here's, here's some different bead walls that people have made out of just like canes and different things made a whole big wall for their garden. It's kind of a, a sculpture, kind of piece of art in the garden. But it gives some of these beneficial bees some place to, to reproduce. Carpenter bees. Do, do people, do you like these guys? These are, uh, again, we're talking about bees. This one actually excavates its own tunnels. So they can do damage on barns and eaves of houses and decks. I have a, my deck has some tunnels in it. They might have a tunnel that long, so they go in there. And they're going to have partition each little cell with shoot up wood, uh, sort of particle board like stuff. But they can be actually damaging. We tell people if you want to get rid of them, if they're doing damage to structures, you probably ought to get some insecticide dust like delta dust, delta methrin puff it in there each spring. I put out the little things that look like a, a birdhouse. They got a hole in the side and they'll go in there and the bottom's a little, little soda bottle like this, upside down, you know, and they get, they go out. You cut the top off and you do that to the bottom and they drop down in there. You don't have to have liquid in it, but you could put uh, antifreeze or something. But they get lost in there, drop down, can't get out. But you would take quite a few of those to catch all of them. And I have got it. They still do damage. I, I haven't tracked them out. But that's one thing you can try. There's what the cells, you see what the cells look like? Each one is a little. So it makes more sense now what those what those tunnels are about. They're just, that's how they, they uh, reproduce. Put the larvae in. Let's talk about bumblebees. Generalist versus specialist. Bumblebees are generalists in that they feed on many different types of plants. What's a succession of plants? You let leave a field fallow, what happens? Certain flowers come up in the spring, they bloom, produce seeds, and they die down. Then midsummer, you got other flowers. By fall, you might see goldenrod, you might see asters. So they're feeding on whatever flowers are coming up in that pasture throughout the summer. Okay. From early spring until early fall when the colony dies, but new a queen is produced in the world of winter. Other uh, bees, they like to more specialize. They might only go after one family of plants or, or just a few type plants. So that's where all these species of native bees, we have lots of different native plants and a lot of native bees that specialize on that. Okay. And it says specialists may collect nectar from more plants than they collect uh, pollen from. Okay. Squash bees, you ever heard of those? Very efficient pollinators, and they get on cucurbits, squash, and melons, and things like that. Blueberry bees, we'll be targeting more blueberries. Uh, here's one called a micropsis. Uh, it collects oil and pollen on loose stripe flowers, okay? So that's the only place they get pollen from. So they don't have that, they're going to starve to death. Isn't that amazing? Now they get pollen from other flowers. But, so they're very specialized. 
The squash bee is about the size of a honeybee, and they are out very early. When's the squash blossom open up? Anybody know? Is it, around, is it in the morning or the It's actually before sunrise almost. Early morning, you can go out, and these bees are all ready. And so a squash blossom is going to open up in the morning. It's going to be pollinated or not pollinated by those bees. Then by late afternoon, once it starts doing, it starts closing up, and it's, it's, it's either mated or it's going to drop off. It's either going to produce a fruit. And so when we use an insecticide as a spray in a, in a cucumber field or a cantaloupe field, what type of time of day would we tell the farmers to spray? If they spray in the morning, they're going to get insecticide in the flowers and they're going to kill the bees. If they spray in late evening, the bees, the bees are not there, the flowers have already closed up for the day. So we say later in the day. Yeah. Look at there. There's a nice little common squash bee, about honeybee size. Isn't that pretty? It's, that's kind of noisy that some of this I always in the other room hear that when the fan comes on and boom <laughs> and it out and that. bumblebees there's over 50 species about 50 species in North America we think oh that's a bumblebee there's, well there's depending where you are there's different species black furry usually yellow or white stripes or orange stripes uh, they're not as big and long lived colonies as honeybees, but they can have, they are social insects. You don't want to get around one of their nests, they will sting. And the difference between a honeybee, a honeybee has a barbed stinger, so it stings you once, it pulls out the stinger and dies, that, that honeybee. Bumblebee can get on your sock and your pants and they can sting you repeatedly. And I don't like that, I about beat my leg one time. Uh, they were stinging me so much. There's a nice little bumblebee there on a cone flower. And another species, the common eastern bumblebee. You seen some of these? I should have brought my pictures. I had them all on posters. I should have brought it so you guys could look at them later. I forgot. So bumblebees and honeybees have these specialized pollen bag, uh, baskets called corbiculae on their hind legs. Okay. And they have these little strong seta on the tibial segment of the hind leg, and they pack that with pollen, mixed with nectar and saliva, and they call them capitular pellet. So they're very efficient in collecting honey and uh, nectar, I mean, and their, uh, their uh, pollen. What is honey? Honey is just uh, nectar that's been you know, evaporated, a lot of water out and made it thicker. You know, when we make maple syrup, you know how many gallons of maple syrup you have to boil to get the water off of it to make the concentration we call maple syrup? How many gallons of maple nectar? Anybody have any idea? Well, 40. 40, yeah. There you go. About 40 gallons. So they have to do the same thing with nectar. you got to evaporate. They do that in their mouth. They evaporate it. And look here, here's a two-spotted bumblebee and, and pretty long mouth parts getting on that flower. That's a very beautiful bumblebee. So you see that in the garden, okay. when we grow, when we plant plants, we're planting for, for our enjoyment, but we're also planting for the, the environment. When we do things in our garden, think I think insects number one, but. Uh, Plants provide food for insects. Some insects, caterpillars, feed on. What's a caterpillar that we like to uh, have a milkweed in the garden for? What kind of butterfly feeds on? The caterpillar, the monarch feeds on. It. So if you grow milkweeds, you make it more monarchs. What about uh, parsley or dill, things like that? The carrot family, black swallowtails, like that. What about pipevine uh, ornamental plant? It's a pipevine swallowtail. How many people have ever planted a pawpaw tree? I was, yeah, I was just up in Ohio and my dad had all these pawpaws and they were falling on the ground, about that big. And I actually tasted one, it was perfect. 
perfectly right just this last weekend. And uh, so the zebra swallowtail lays its egg on the pawpaw leaves. So by having these plants, you're providing for butterflies. Without the plants, you won't have the butterflies. Uh, so you've got to have it. Pollinator, oh, they use this impatient bumblebee as a pollinator in greenhouse tomatoes. It's called buzz pollination. So you have a little colony of bees, you put it in the greenhouse. Once it's in the greenhouse, it's kind of trapped in there with the, with your tomatoes. And they, what do they do when they come up the, the, the tomato plant? They kind of, when they're, when they're feeding on it, they buzz it, they vibrate it, the pollen then sheds and falls on the flowers. So that's how they, uh, they shed the pollen that way. That's how they get pollinated. So you put sugar water in there so they'll, because tomatoes don't produce nectar, so you got to have a source of carbohydrate. And uh, they say bumblebees are also good pollinators of clover. So if you grow clover fields, want to produce seed, you got to have bumblebees. Uh, carpenter bees aren't fuzzy all over. On the upper abdomen, it looks black and glossy. So that's how you tell the difference between a carpenter bee and a, and a bumblebee. And the male uh, carpenter bees are somewhat aggressive, but remember, male bees can't sting, only female bee, bees can sting. So the males are aggressive, they'll get in your face. A, a male carpenter bee will be right there looking at you, trying to stare you down, uh, but you won't. You might be scared until you realize it's a male on these harmless. Sometimes the uh, carpenter bees will feed on the side of a flower, they make a slip. They don't maybe have long enough tongue to reach the foot the, down in the nectar. They'll, they'll come in from the uh, from the side and they won't get the pollen in on them because they drop the flower from the side. There's a little eastern carpenter bee. You see the black abdomen? So now you guys can tell the difference between a carpenter bee with the black shiny abdomen and a bubble bee, which had a lot more yellow, fuzzy yellow. There's some of the damage carpenter bees do on the decks and siding and such. So each one of those is a tunnel made by the female. There are small carpenter bees. They often nest in uh, the pith of stems like blackberry or roses. Sometimes, we'll, and sometimes when you see a little hole or a clip of the rose, some people will get a little umber's glue and they'll stick it over the end of the rose because they, the bees will often get in there. There's what a, a small carpenter bee looks like. I don't know if I've seen that many of them, but I recognize them. It's a lot smaller bee. South uh, eastern blueberry bee, you know, we really don't see that much in Tennessee, probably a little further south. The most efficient pollinators of blueberries, a lot more efficient than, than the honeybees. Uh, they vibrate the whole thing, they sort of vibrate because their, their wings are flatten so fast and they do this buzz pollination they call it sonication anybody have a uh, one of the sonic air toothbrushes you know, mm -hmm. vibrate the same idea and they shake out the pollen from the anthers and it uh, clings to their bodies and then when they get in there they pollinate that's what they look like southeastern blueberry bees here's one called the longhorn bee female and look at the long mouth parts on that one. The Megachilidae, uh, mason bees and leaf cutter bees. And these carry their pollen on the underside of their abdomens, not on the legs, okay? Not on the back legs. The blue orchard bee would be a good example of one of these. It's a good pollinator in the orchard. Those are pretty, that's a nice drawing of them. Have anybody ever seen these? I don't know if I've seen them that much, but you figure if you've seen them, you remember what you did. Are they normally that blue? I think they are. That's a drawing, not a photo. Yeah. I've seen them on the orchard. That's an Oz, the genus is Osmia, but uh, that's on Sweet Cherry. Here's another uh, Megachella Day. You can see it. That's and little bee, it looks sort of like honey bees look in a lot of these. So uh, a big headed bee, big head, look at the size of the eyes on that thing. It's the big headed bee. 
And there's a cuckoo leaf cutter bee. And lots of different bees. And again, I couldn't go out and probably tell you what half the bees are flying around. I mean, you know, I'd have to get my book out and look at it and study it. You see the veins on the wings? Entomologists will look at the veins on the wings and the pattern. Each one of those little cells has a name. It's numbered. And each one of those veins has a name. And so you can look at books and you can tell an insect what family it is, whatever, by the venation on the wings. So we use that a lot with, uh, with uh, bees and things like flying insects. Kind of like leaves. Yeah, yeah. They each, the, 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 leaf, the wing will have a characteristic shape. It will have certain structures on it. And so that being an entomologist, they, you know, you're counting hairs, you're counting seeds on some caterpillars to identify them. You're looking at the book name. There's a lot of uh, discerning. Uh, the sweat bees, the lictids, these are really kind of pretty. They have a lot of shiny metal metallic greens and blues. One, one Agachlora, I guess it is, Pura, means a pure, magnificent green bee. That sounds like something in Central America, doesn't it? They nest in, in the bark rotting logs, okay? There's the metallic green bee that's right there. That's a pretty one. There's, these are in the sweat bee family. Now there's a little, some people, there's a hover fly. It's a little serpent fly. It's beneficial. Lays its eggs on where aphids are. Sometimes you'll see this little fly that looks bee-like. And it will land on your arm. And people probably think it's a sweat bee, but it's not. It won't stink. And they're called hover flies um, or serpent flies. But a little halectic sometimes will sting and you know, if you slap them on your arm. Here's that pure green agricola. I don't know how to pronounce it. But it's a pretty bee. It's got metallic green. Was, they actually build their nest under you know, old logs, rotten logs. They'll get some of that old rotten wood and stuff and uh, build an envelope for their eggs. And they'll put that pollen in there. She'll have a little pollen, uh, needs a pollen loaf, so to speak, and she'll, these things will be like tiles, and she'll stack them in there, and they'll plaster on the walls of the brood chamber, and when she lays the egg and silk, she'll seal that cell completely, and that will keep out the predators, ants and other predators. And then she's provisioned it with all these little loaves of pollen and nectar. There's a little another elliptic bee. You've probably seen a lot of bees, like bees out there. And sometimes bees nest. We are seeing this in the ground, little holes in the ground. That's where some of the bee nests are. How about in during the day, minor bees? These are ground nesters also. Mostly dark looking bee. Uh, some could be reddish, some could be metallic. They have velvety patches. Foveae on their faces is between their eyes and the base of the antennae. So I didn't hear, I guess. Most are active, again, early spring, and these might get on apples, maples, willows. So their activity, like a honeybee, can be active when? As long as you keep moving that honeybee hive where you have flowering plants, it can be active year round in Florida, can it? And so most of our pollination, you know where most of our honeybee hives go to pollinate? Where they're taken? Well, how many people have been to California? Nice place to visit. Well, we have thousands of acres of almond trees. And so most of our honeybees pollinate the almond crops. We're putting them in every year. Almonds are healthy and their people are growing them. And uh, they can make money on them. And so most of the honeybees if you just have the pure number or move to pollinate that or move to pollinate the canola oil crops in the upper Midwest or move around. And honeybees are very low on. But these guys right here, these are native bees and they're only active in the early spring. So they only work on these type of plants. Here's one that, that pollinates dogwoods. Dogwood and, and green. Kind of pretty. 
here's one, Mason's Andrea. What kind of flower is that? I'm not sure what kind of flower it is. It's virtually a native flower. And here's another one. So they're really wrapping all the way around that uh, anchors and stigma there. But it looks somewhat wasp like, but it's a bee. Uh, they're called cellophane bees. You ever heard of these? They're uh, yellow masses of bees and such. They have pollen baskets. Uh, they don't have pollen baskets. They carry the pollen in their crop. What's a crop? When an insect has, right when it goes from the mouth, there's an uh, area there where, where food can collect. It's kind of a bag, and that's called the crop. And then they can probably regurgitate pollen if they need to. Often they look like a wasp that nest in pithy stems. And they'll make uh, large aggregations of nests and use a cellophane-like material. And they exude that from glands. And they'll line their brood cells with it. And there's a cellophane beetle there. I don't think I have a picture of the nest. When I say cellophane beetle, cellophane bee. Uh, let's talk about honeybees a little bit. They're not native, but they're here, aren't they? There's probably not as many honeybees made of wild honeybees as there used to be. And again, it's not because of pesticides, it's because of the grow mite and the invasive pests that are, that are killing them. The, the bees that aren't managed has, have less likelihood to survive. The bees that have beekeepers that will use pesticides to help control the grow mites, they'll make sure the hives are clean, they don't get, you know, foul brood disease, and, other insects. There's one called the Southern Hive Beetle from South Africa. They've been intact uh, beehives. There's the wax moths that will attack beehives. But uh, the honeybees are not as good. If you had one honeybee against a native bee, like a southeastern blueberry bee, which one's going to be the best pollinator for those blueberries? The south, the native bee is. But what we can do with honeybees is we can produce millions of them. We can make lots of hives and we can move those hives. So when, when a crop is ready, for when it's flowering, guess what we have right beside the field where the crop is? We bring in the bees. We bring the bees to the crop. So if it's an apple orchard, we'll bring bees to the, the edge of the field. So they can be trans, easily transported in high numbers. And uh, as long as it's a nice sunny day, they'll be out on it. Sometimes you'll see a swarm when, when a hive gets sort of too big and, and what it splits up, uh, a queen will leave and they'll make the swarm and they'll look for somewhere else to, to make a nest. And, and you'll still see these. This is in my backyard. And when you see one, what do you do? You call up a beekeeper and they'll usually come and get it from you. Okay. Anybody, here is my, here's my, uh, you might get this, you might not. We have, a, I guess we have numbers, but you'll get my. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't have anything to give you. But does anybody know what flower that is? It was named after Benjamin Franklin. It was found in the Georgia Southeast. It was found out in the woods, and it's never been found in the woods since. Maybe it's been cultivated. It's, it's a beautiful flower. Almost, almost looks like some dogwood. Yeah, it's, it's a big flower. It kind of looks like a camellia flower or a stewardia flower. It's the Franklinia tree, named after Benjamin Franklin. I think did one of the Bartrams named that. I'm trying to think. William Bartram, one of the early uh, botanists in a few areas. But anyway, that's in the North Carolina Arboretum in Asheville. Questions? That was, we, we got done in 50 minutes or less. That's pretty good. Yes, sir. When was the first time you mentioned about uh, Bill Jones' nest and the houses for the bees? When is the best time of the year to do this? This time of year or spring? Well, I would be doing that so they're in the <coughs> spring because a lot of those bees are active on flowers. A lot of our native plants are blooming in the spring. So depending on the bee, 
but I believe the a lot of those bees are spraying, active in spray. So you want, want to have that. You can take these nests inside during the winter if you want, unless they have stuff in. If it's a new one, they put it out in the spring. Then you want to leave it until the following spring, and so that they can leave it. Then you want to have some new cells or new straws to put in after the the ones that were in there have left. See what I mean? So you you want to take care of it every year. You're gonna, you know. Redrill holes or put new clean straws in. I don't think the average person realizes the importance of insects like that. Uh, oh yeah. It's it's so many of them out there. You don't you don't really know the name. You don't know when or what, but they're out there. And they're uh, there year round, aren't they? And they're yeah. beneficial. They're beneficial. Exactly. Now there are a lot of people you've heard about. You might have heard about. We got about five. Uh, 10 minutes to the talk. I might as well finish the whole hour. Have you heard about colony collapse disorder? You know what I'm talking about? Colony collapse is this thing where we've been having bees not do very well. It might go, bees go through the summertime, and then what happens? The, the, some of them will die in the summer, and some over winter. The, the bees aren't, they're gone. It leaves the hive, and, uh, and, and the hive is gone, basically. And so part of that, they think, has to do with stress and uh, a good part of it. So, but the first thing, tend to, what do ten people tend to blame first? Pesticides, right? All Systemic pesticides. pesticides. Yeah. yeah. And what we found is that places that have varroa mite, especially, will see more of this colony class disorder. And that's that varroa mite. Imagine, I'll describe a varroa mite. If I'm a bee larva, and I've got something about the size of a football on my back, and that football has a football has mouth parts like a drill, and it, it pierces my back and it's sucking my blood. That's what a varroa mite does. So it's attached to that larvae while it's developing in a cell. It's feeding on that bee, and so you can see these mites on the bees. They're brown. They're dark colored, and so this thing, and they can also transmit viruses. So the number one thing that we think is causing this phenomenon called colony collapse is probably invasive pests and diseases that are spread. We also stress our bees out. We're moving them all over the place. We're putting them on trucks and moving them many miles. It also could be poor genetics. You know, we kind of tend to use the same queens with the same genetics. And they're actually looking for bees in nature out in the wild that have preening type behavior where so they'll actually grab the grow mites and bite them and get them off of other bees or themselves. You see what I mean? So you're looking for mean honeybees? Yeah, a little meaner, a little more aggressive. Uh, we're going to see that the Africanized bee is moving this way. I don't think it's been found in Tennessee. It's been found in Texas. But it's a more aggressive honeybee. If you looked at one, you really couldn't with the naked eye tell the difference between a, what we call a domesticated bee and a more feral Africanized bee. Yeah. Are they going to breed out their violence as they move further? That's further? a good question. As they, I don't know. I don't think so, but we'll see. But right now, I thought we'd have more of these so-called killer bees, Africanized bees. I thought we'd have them here by now do a lot more damage. But if you get near one, you're in Texas, let's say, Louisiana, maybe Louisiana, and you get near one, they can, you can get stunned by hundreds of bees potentially, which would not be good. Now, what do we know about safety in bees? Bees and wasps, when they stink, I mean, anybody here allergic to bees? Yeah, if, you, if you are, you're going to have to buy one of those $600 EpiPens they've been talking about in the news. Yeah. Read about that? Epinephrine or adrenaline type pens, you keep those handy because if you do get stung, you'll get an allergic reaction. So bees, and what's another insect that can cause an allergic reaction that we have here in Middle Tennessee? You see little mounds on the grass. What are we talking about? Fire ants. Fire ants. Fire ants. Imported fire ants. They're not from here. They're imported. They came from South America and uh, got here accidentally. They moved throughout the South. They're now all the way up into Kentucky, 
land between the lakes area has fire ants now. So they keep moving northward. If we have warmer winters in the future, guess what? They're going to move even farther north. We have a red imported fire ant, we have a black imported fire ant, and we have a hybridized imported fire ant. And the hybrid can withstand colder temperatures. But remember, these ants are underground, so they can get away from a lot of the cold in winter. They're insulated in some way. But still, they, you know, it's a real cold winter, we'll, we'll see a big uh, knockdown of fire ants. If you have fire ants in your neighborhood, what do you do? Get insecticide baits. A very tiny amount of insecticide is on a bait. You disperse that on a nice warm day. They'll take it back to the nest, feed it to them. They'll put it in their crop. They'll dissolve it, the toxic it. They regurgitate, feed the larval ants, just like maybe bees would do. So ants are related to bees, aren't they? They're all hymenoptera. So they can all do that stinging thing. <coughs> we really need to have a neighborhood fire ant party, though. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea, isn't it? Uh, in Texas, I know uh, somebody asked me if we're doing that here in Tennessee. In Texas, they will do that. Whole neighborhoods will come together, they'll chip in money, and they'll buy enough uh, bait to treat the whole neighborhood. By doing that, you get a lot better control. If one neighbor does it and the next does it, uh, over here doesn't, it's not going to do very good. So that's a good that's a good thing that works. So you might have that someday. If you start getting fire ants, talk talk to your homeowner association or your neighbors, and you might want to do that collectively to get rid of your uh, it works real well. You put out the fire ant bait in the spring, you can do it in the fall. I send, if it's a bad infestation, I'll put it out in spring and fall. And there's a lot of different baits now. But the toxicant is very low dose spread it out, they take it back to the nest. So little, very little problem environmentally. Yes? I hate to take all the time, but uh, is it any study that's been made, or what can you tell us about spraying for mosquitoes? They're going to get more and more spray out there. Yeah, and whenever you fog, what do we like to do for mosquito control? We like to do uh, an abatement type program. One thing we got to the larval stages. So if you have water and uh, stagnant ponds, water that's just sitting there but it has a lot of mos breeds mosquito larvae, they'll throw mosquito dunks in them. It's a Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis. It's a BTI. And this is a toxicant derived from natural occurring bacteria. And it's fairly safe. Animals can drink out of it. You throw one of these little briquettes or little donut things in there and they dissolve and it kills the mosquito larvae. Okay, so any time you have in your neighborhood, if you have old paint cans, if you got buckets, you know, I went to my church and they had buckets that with sand in them they used for the luminaries. And the buckets are setting straight up so they collect water when it rains. Well, I turned every bucket on the side because <coughs> that's just a mosquito breeding place. So anything you can do in your neighborhood to collect the trash and the cups and anything holds water could potentially have mosquitoes. Because a lot of these mosquitoes will reproduce and do some little holes in trees. We call them tree hole mosquitoes. They just need a little bit of water and they can re or a cup. That cup right there, you can have bird, 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 bird bass. Yeah, yeah, you've seen wigglers in there. Those little wigglers are the mosquito larvae. Will they leave it alone if it's moving water? Usually, yeah, it's more stagnant water. And, and, and if you have fish in there, again, boozy and other small fish that eat larvae, that's good. So that's the one thing non insecticidal we can do. They're talking, they also can fog. When you fog, like you're talking, spray insecticide, you kill the adults. You can kill parasitoid wasps, you can kill bees. Any kind of flowering plants that you spray in your yard, cover your flowering plants with a tarp. If you're going to spray your lawn for white grubs that are attacking the roots of your grass, mow before you spray. Anytime you spray in your yard, mow first. You don't want the clover or the dandelions attracting bees to your yard because if you're spraying, you don't want the, the bees, uh, you don't want those flowers sprayed and you don't want the bees coming in. So just by mowing first helps considerably. So Have we been spraying at the proper time here in uh, Nashville? 
Well, well, I don't know how much spraying. I think we used to do more mosquito spraying municipalities in the past than they do today. I think today it's they've been doing a lot of it in Nashville trying to get rid of the Zika. Well, yeah, they're they're trying to uh, kill mosquitoes that could potentially transmit Zika virus. Yeah, and we do have the the Asian tiger mosquito. Out, uh, it's called uh, what is that one? Uh, Aedes albopictus. It came from Asia, and that's the mosquito that bites you during the day and really hurts, bites your ankles. You'll be out in the garden. Usually, we think of mosquitoes what dawn and dusk type phenomena. Asian tiger mosquitoes out there in the daytime, and that one can transmit Zika. It can transmit dengue fever, and so there's talks now of how can we control mosquitoes. They're talking about trying to use genetic manipulation to make them go extinct. I mean, they, there's lots of species of mosquitoes, but there's, let's say, I don't know how many, but there's just a few, uh, a few that are doing all the damage or doing, spreading a lot of the diseases. The 80s mosquitoes transmit yellow fever, dengue fever, chikungunya, another new one, the uh, Zika. Uh, so, and then you have Anopheles mosquitoes transmit malaria. So around the world today, Mosquitoes are probably the most dangerous animal alive. It's not a tiger, it's not a bull elephant, it's not a water buffalo. Mosquitoes cause more death around the world, millions of people every year. So we think of uh, here, we don't get malaria, we don't see the yellow fever, but at one time we had these uh, diseases. And we drained the swamps, we still have the mosquitoes, but the disease went extinct in our area. So TVA put a big drop in the water. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they knocked down all the, a lot of the, so we thought, think of wetlands, well, there used to be a lot more wetlands, but with wetlands came what? Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, and with mosquitoes came disease, and we had no way to fight it back in the day, other than drain the wetlands, so. Some people say it's not good to make a species go extinct, or other people say, wow, we can save millions and millions of lives. The, what's more important? It's, it's one of those things. If it's your child that dies, then you probably say, let's get rid of the mosquito. But, uh, anyway, I don't want to keep you this past hour. Thanks for being here. I'll be around and talk a little bit if you want to afterwards. Thanks again. Thanks. Oh, yeah, I guess.